Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are so glad y'all are here. People from across the country and around the world have, have joined us here tonight. So welcome to the Atlanta Speech School. Uh, our school was founded 84 years ago with a singular purpose of ensuring every child has a voice. And our continuing commitment in the pursuit of equity, we've never, equity, we've never turned away a child because of financial uh, circumstances of their family. For 24 years now, I've watched my colleagues beat the odds for thousands of children who neurobiologically should have struggled for a lifetime. Instead, through the science of language and literacy, they found their voices here. The ability to decide their own futures and make the greatest difference possible in the lives of others, a true voice. Well, good evening, I'm Comer Yates and I have the privilege again of being the executive director of the Atlanta Speech School. We're here tonight because as a country, we have systematically left the millions and millions of our children voiceless without access to their futures, cruelly determined by their zip code, race and ethnicity. To paraphrase Dr. Goldie Muhammad, we have left them for others to tell their story. This unconscionable circumstance is why we started the, our Rollins Center for Language and Literacy in 2004, recognizing through the work of the National Reading Panel and others that our country knew exactly what to do to end this crisis. 18 years later, the question still remains unanswered. Do we have the will to do what it takes? For that purpose, we're so fortunate tonight to be able to hear from three preeminent national scholars, Dr. Laura Justice, Dr. Mark Seidenberg, and Dr. Julie Washington, who have so much to tell us about the path forward, the best path forward, the path forward that our children and their teachers who've been denied generation after generation with, from the expertise and the agency that they should have been afforded to meet their children and to be able to be their best selves with children by a system that's failed our teachers as much as it's failed our children. Um, our, our colleagues to speak tonight are here tonight and all of us are present because of the generosity of the Montag family who's brought this lecture um, to life for the past 24 years. We're also so grateful for the hundreds of school districts, experts, agencies, and funders all over the country with whom we have joined together to ensure that we can take comprehensive change for children and teachers to scale with powerful partnerships. We're really particularly grateful for our partnership with the city of Marietta, where they've made a community-wide effort to create an ecosystem for the construction of each child in Marietta's deep reading brain. And we know that that deep reading brain construction for the work of Pat Cool and others begins even before birth. And so through the birthing hospital in Marietta, there are preschools and language rich preschools where children are learn to listen and they learn to think creatively and critically and with empathy rather than being silenced um, through elementary schools where explicit instruction is so much more is happening for the children and the teachers are supported and gaining the expertise to do that work through extraordinary leadership there. We're anxious to join with all of you in this effort. Uh, all of you who recognize a basic fact, enough's enough. And to the extent that this is the time as Marianne Wolf said five years ago, this is a hinge moment. Are we ready to make a commitment to this be an inflection point together. I'd love for you to reach out to us. My cell phone is 404-245-0327. It'll be in the chat. Um, please, I hope you'll, you'll join us with us in this effort. And so many are doing such extraordinary things around the country. I hope it's time now for us all to band together. Um, I do wanna take this moment um, for a personal expression of thanks. Um, uh, Sandra Mims, who has worked at the speech school for the last 35 years, beginning as a classroom speech language pathologist, classroom teacher, director of our Ward Law School, and for the past years, our chief academic officer. Uh, Sandra has been a defining presence um, in the work of our school. There's no way to overstate the impact of her expertise and matching sense unwavering sense of justice and equity and what that's meant for every child 
who has crossed um, through into the speech school for or for the children of the 200,000 members of our free online Cox campus around the country and around the world. Uh, Sandra, I couldn't be more grateful. And I know our, your 230 other colleagues join me um, in, in our in deepest gratitude. Well, now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Ryan Lee James, who is the, is the director of our Rollins Center for Language and Literacy in, our, in its Cox campus. Ryan joined us two years ago from her tenure track position in an effort to try to join again with others to affect this change that we're all, all seeking. And um, similarly, um, Ryan has made all the difference in our, our work here, and I'm so grateful and proud to be her colleague. So Ryan, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Here. And again, I um, look forward to the evening. Ryan? Hey, Comer, thank you. Comer, can you hear me? I sure can. All right, great. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you're here. I'm not gonna take too much more time because we wanna get to our speakers. As Comer said, I'm Ryan Lee James. I'm the director of the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy and its free online Cox campus here at the Atlanta Speech School. I'm delighted to be here with all of you tonight and really grateful to see the active chat already happening um, and so grateful so many of you could join us from around the country and the world. I wanna echo Comer with some really quick thank yous. Thank you to our friends, Mr. and Mrs. Montag, uh, for sponsoring uh, the 24th annual Montag Lecture. Over the years, the Montag Lecture has grown in reach and impact. And on behalf of my colleagues at the Speech School, we're deeply grateful for your unwavering and continuous support. Next, I'd like to thank our generous philanthropic partners. It's because of your investment that we're able to democratize the sciences, of healthy early brain development, language and literacy, on our, via our free online Cox campus. I'd like to extend deepest uh, and sincerest appreciation to our Montag committee, Catherine Sabonis, Director of Communications, and Laura Coleman, Susan Brown, Director of Development, Tiffany Carter, our beloved communications and marketing strategist, Aaron Spitalnik, Director of IT, of course, our dear Chief Ac Academic Officer, Sandra Mims, and thank you, thank you, thank you to the incomparable Haven Long. Last but not least, I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us. As Comer mentioned, our country is indeed at an inflection point. Over two years into the global pandemic, children around the country have experienced disrupted education, resulting in a learning debt that experts forecast could take decades to improve. And as with all public health crises, disenfranchised children or those who research describes as at risk have been disproportionately impacted. School districts, legislatures, educators and families across the country are asking, how do we accelerate student outcomes while also adequately addressing social emotional needs of children? Well, as Comer mentioned at the speech school, we're in pursuit of deep reading brains for all children. We subscribe to Goldie Muhammad and Marianne Wolf's philosophies, which describe deep reading and deep literacy as a destination beyond proficiency, where children think critically about what they read, are able to take the perspectives of others and develop criticality. Goldie Muhammad defines criticality as the, cap as the capacity and ability to read, write, think, and speak in ways to understand power and equity in order to promote anti-oppression. But what do we do to get kids to that point? A whole lot of skill development. It's hard for many of us to conceptualize beyond proficiency when our national reading data was abysmal even before COVID. A constant reminder of our persistent systems failure. Well, tonight our speakers are gonna to talk to us about the current state of research and practice as it relates to development of oral language and literacy. And the <clears throat> hearing from these three experts is timely because they have dedicated their careers to improving educational outcomes for all students. It's our hope that you will be inspired to think, reflect, act on the knowledge you've gained on behalf of all children. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Justice. Laura Justice is a distinguished professor of educational psychology at The Ohio State University. 
She is a language scientist and expert on interventions to promote children's literacy. Laura's focus in this discussion will be on building vocabulary as a route for improved reading comprehension. Please welcome Dr. Laura Justice. Great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I assume you can hear me. Um, we can okay. hear you good, Laura, but we can't see your video. Okay. I am going to screen share. Okay. Um, hopefully. Give me just one minute. We'll get this rolling. Um, in the meantime, I would like to say thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, are, is the screen share good now? Okay. It's hopefully. perfect. Perfect. All right. Let me start by, first of all, see what time it is because I am, I do not have much time to get through 33 slides, but I want to thank the Atlanta Speech School um, uh, and all your leaders, Ryan Lee James, Comer Yates, for bringing um, us here and all your team for being just fantastic hosts. Um, it's an honor to be here with everyone. Um, by way of background, I'm a speech language pathologist by training and an educational researcher. And my focus tonight is um, I'm really interested in helping practitioners translate research into everyday scalable practices that they use in their classroom. So that's going to be my lens tonight. Um, I'm really excited about um, the other two presentations, and I think you'll find them hopefully complementary, but quite distinct. Um, and again, as um, Ryan pointed out, I'm going to talk about reading, uh, I'm sorry, improving vocabulary is a route to improved reading comprehension. And I wanted to start this um, short lecture by highlighting the focus of this, con of this conference, that equity is achievable and necessary for the future we hold as ideal, and it is only possible when every child can read. And so when we look at the data, even pre-COVID, it was pretty horrific. Um, in, in COVID, after COVID, things have just really taken a tumble in terms of our students' um, success as readers. We are not doing well by our children. And as Comer pointed out, um, I agree with you completely. We do know what to do in a lot of cases. I'm going to talk to you tonight about some really simple things we can do to promote vocabulary, which have been empirically validated for over 30 years um, in some cases. And so we do know what to do. What we don't do well is translate and scale. And so I am absolutely tickled that so many people on the front lines came here tonight, are paying attention, and are going to take the information you learned tonight and you're going to push it outwards because it's it's got to be you all who do this. Um, so I am going to start with um, some really basic work on reading because I want to center our conversation on what reading is and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, because as you all know, reading can be un unfortunately quite controversial. Well, I want to start with the premise that reading is very, very complicated. It does not emerge naturally as part of human development. It is superimposed upon other more basic systems that were hardwired um, for various purposes like the visual system. It is a complex human behavior and that's why so many children do not achieve their full potential because it's complicated. And in that regard, teaching reading is complicated. And don't ever let anybody poke at you and say, oh, you know, reading is easy. I learned to read, my kids learn to read. It's very, very complicated. And that's why we haven't quite nailed it. What well, that's at least in part. So I want to start now. I want to start by just making sure um, we all have a common definition of reading to anchor this presentation. And it's possible that Mark Seidenberg in his talk is going to say um, that wasn't the right angle, but I'm the one talking right now. So it's my moment to give you a model of reading to guide at least this part of the presentation. Um, and I bring that up because I know he's talking about the science of reading. So what I want us to do is um, let's do reading. Let's all do reading. This is um, a simple sentence from the beginning of a really lovely children's book, Something from Nothing. So everybody take a moment and read that. Okay, when Joseph was a baby, his grandfather made him a wonderful blanket. So we all just did the thing we want 
every child to do pretty early in life. First grade should be able to read simple text like this. So what is reading? Now I'm gonna call up the simple view of reading, even though it's sort of paradoxical from just saying that reading is super complex, there is a model that I think we can center our work on. Now, lots of people quibble about, is this the right model? Should it be more sophisticated? But for the purposes of the time tonight, it's gonna work just fine. So reading what you just did when you read that simple passage is considered the product of two things, D, and C. And it's a multiplicative relationship, not additive, in that we need to be able to decode and comprehend to read. And so um, the simple view of reading, you know, simply says that if a child's going to be a proficient or ideally advanced reader, they have to have the tools to crack the alphabetical code, alphabetic code, and they have to have the tools to understand what we read. And we have spent decades in this country really hammering on getting the tools that allow kids to be um, sufficient decoders. Um, you know, back in you know the National Reading Panel work um, and everything that came after that with No Child Left Behind, the emphasis has really, really, really been on decoding. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a multiplicative relationship. So kids have to be able to go to get to comprehension. But I would argue that we have really sort of undermined and undertaught the um, role of comprehension in being a reader. And part of it is because comprehension is really hard to understand. It involves language and language is quite an esoteric um, dimension of development. Not a lot of people understand. but. I think we just invested a little bit too much in the decoding part. Um, and so we don't actually know as much about how to teach comprehension. And so because we don't know as much, we kind of ignore it out in the field. This um, tonight is all about getting to deep comprehension, not superficial comprehension. And I would argue with the misinformation flying around this world and causing us so much agony and strife as people, it's because kids and adults don't know how to deep comprehend. Um, what is deep comprehension? You know, simply it's we're reading text and the goal is to acquire new language. I'm sorry, acquire new knowledge. You know, maybe you re want to read about how it is we got to where we are in Ukraine and Russia. You're going to read heavily on that topic to understand more. Well, that's deep comprehension. You're integrating new knowledge with existing knowledge. You're analyzing texts and their sources, which is critical. Um, we have to understand when sources are authentic and valid. And then what's also crucial is being able to synthesize across multiple texts. So, you know, I mean, everybody is aware of what's happening um, you know, in Eastern Europe, and we're all reading lots and trying to understand, and maybe you read something about this and this source and this another, and then we have to synthesize. So when we talk about deep comprehension, it's this higher order comprehension. Um, and there are some key prerequisite skills that need to feed into that. Academic language, perspective taking, and complex reading. These are all higher order, um, I would call them higher order language skills, or at least cognitive processes. And so what I'm going to do is zero in on academic language in particular vocabulary is a route to being able to comprehend deeply and i'm going to talk about something that's actually a really simple concept that i think can be transformative in your classroom next week um, and it's the idea of teaching, explicitly teaching what I'm going to call general all-purpose academic vocabulary words. And I think the general all-purpose academic vocabulary might have been coined by um, Catherine Snow. Um, but in recent years, as there's been efforts to translate this work into classrooms and clinics, people are using different sort of more accessible ways um, to describe the notion of general all-purpose academic using words like 50 cent words, magic words, sparkle words, I like power words, tier two words, academic vocabulary. And I'm, I'm gonna go further in defining this, but it's a certain type of word that we need to teach and the evidence suggests that we're not. Um, but why we want to be thinking about this um, approach to vocabulary instruction is 
it's a major, what we're going to call a pressure point in deep comprehension. So when you need to comprehend deeply, perhaps for the purpose of synthesis, there's, there's lots of cognitive and linguistic processes that we're calling upon. And each one of those can serve as like a bottleneck. And um, this is vocabulary, academic vocabulary. If kids don't have this, or it's, it's limited, underdeveloped, what we see is creation of the mental model of the text, which we need for comprehension. It just, it's so shallow and imprecise that kids can't comprehend, um, especially more complex texts. So I'm gonna, I'm going very superficial on a couple key concepts. So just understand that's by design. I had 30 minutes, but I wanna talk briefly about what does it mean to build a lexicon in the child's head? And lexicon is a synonym for vocabulary. So the mental lexicon or mental dictionary is basically all the words inside your brain that you know. Um, with the caveat that we could actually argue a lot about when you even know a word, because the reality is we know some words better than other words. Some of them you're like, eh, it has something to do with this and other words, you know, very deeply and they're very sort of heavily represented in your lexicon. But for tonight's sake, we're gonna, we're gonna say that there's a lexicon in every child, every adult's mind, and it is built over time. It is assembled over time. And in fact, the growth of that mental lexicon is driven by a neurobiological condition called neuroplasticity. And the child's brain is incredibly plastic at birth, actually prenatally, and experience in the environment is gonna shape that plastic brain as a function of environmental stimuli. And in fact, infants, toddlers, we have an extended period of infancy compared to other species because the child is evoking these experiences, which is shaping that brain um, and largely for the purpose of really instilling the language pathways. And so there's a very basic process that's happening. Um, the child's brain is born. Of course, the child's brain is born. The child is born child has a brain and is full of neurons. Um, and this is a very simple picture of one neuron that's red, one that's blue. And what's going to happen is they're going to, I always, they're going to make friends as a function of those experiences. So you have, you know, maybe a mom looking at a bird and pointing to it and saying, it's a bird. Baby looks up, they have a moment of joint attention. It doesn't happen in the moment, but over time, you're going to see neural pathways form that represent bird as that thing that flies and makes these sounds um, and so on and so forth. The peak of synaptogenesis or synaptic formation for the language functions of the brain, the peak of it appears to be around two to three to four years of age. And then you have this plateauing off. And what that means is this period from roughly, you know, just before birth to, you know, age 15, but peaking in the years of early childhood, that's the peak plasticity of the brain, which therefore corresponds to the peak development of these language pathways. And I always wanna talk about this because most of the people on this call are practitioners who work with kids. And when these kids are in our care, when we're educating them, when we're providing therapy, we are providing the experiences the environment that is shaping this very plastic brain. And so these are peak opportunities for sort of richness, but they're also peak opportunities for risk. If you have kids, you know, who are not being talked to at all during this experience expected period of development, you know, we're not harnessing the brain's plasticity and we're sort of robbing the child of the opportunity to shape that brain during this peak period. So what we want to do and what we want to tell everybody else to do is capitalize on brain plasticity during these years to optimize vocabulary growth. Moving on from there, so we have this mental lexicon, we have all these entries in the lexicon like the word blah, and a lot of times when we think about words, we go straight to meaning. We're like, well, a word is the meaning of X. 
But I want to comment that when you have a representation of a word in your mental dictionary, like blah, you know its meaning, but you also know how it sounds. Like you know that blah is not blue. You have an orthographic or print representation. You know the letters that are in it. You know its grammatical role, and you know what we would call its morphology. Um, and so when you know a word, you have a representation of all of these things. And I'm telling you that because it has implications for teaching. What's really important to understand is that kids are not born with a blueprint of a dictionary in their head. So, you know, along sort of humankind, we've had these quibbles, kind of like pe people quibble about anthills. You know, is there a blueprint or is there an emergent structure? And with respect to the mental dictionary, it's what we call an emergent structure. There's no blueprint. There's no, you know, people always want to say, well, is pressure a first grade word? There are no first grade words. There are no second grade words because the mental dictionary is not a blueprint. It emerges over time as a function of environmental forces. And I put up a picture of an anthill on the left. You have the internal cast of an anthill on the right. And every anthill is highly distinct because it's an emergent structure that has its own very specific shape and feel because the ants are following certain gases that are let out in the environment. So the child's brain is an emergent structure that's responding to the environment. That environment is you and everybody else who spends time with that child. It's also important to understand that we don't teach a child a word in a moment. So we don't say, okay, today, you know, it's um, March, so we're gonna learn shamrock. We don't say today is shamrock day and then the child knows that word. And in fact, words are learned in bits and pieces. And so, you know, you take a word like lexicon, and for some of you, I bet you've never heard that word before. And so, you know, before you came here tonight, if I said, what's a lexicon? You I have no idea. I have no idea. Then you hear the word again, and you're like, I ha I, I, it has something to do with vocabulary. Laura Justice mentioned it. Then you develop this deepening knowledge about it. I know it. It has something to do with vocabulary. And then I know it, it means, and you're using the word productively, you understand it. So when we think about vocabulary teaching, you gotta go all in. There isn't Shamrock Day and Pilgrim Day. It's gotta be an extended period of time kids are being exposed to keywords. And so this is just a representation of, to know a word or to develop a representation of it, you're moving from what's a very fragile or shallow state of word knowledge to a very deep knowledge. And so we really want to be mindful of that in our teaching. So what does it take to acquire a word deeply? Really simply repetition and highly informative encounters with the word. Repetition, very informative encounters. Sounds easy, but we got to scale that. So the first tough decision that we have to make is, well, what words am I even going to teach in my classroom or my clinic? Or... And what we know is that kids do have these very powerful and plastic brains, and there's lots of words that are happening in the environment, and kids are exposed to word, you know, moms talking, dads talking, teachers talking, and they are acquiring these words because of those multiple exposures. But there's also words that don't happen very often in the spoken environment, and we need to be teaching those, okay? So the best vocabulary instruction is incidental exposure to lots of words through everyday things like conversations, art, drama, book reading, but then explicit instruction that's deliberately teaching a small set of very important words. And that's these academic all-purpose general words. A lot of the ideas I'm about to share with you come from the work of Isabel Beck and Margaret McEwen at the University of Pittsburgh, who I think their first study on uh, teaching a certain type of vocabulary word as a path, path towards improved reading comprehension. I think that first paper was like 1982. So they've been doing this work for a very long time. It has been partially scaled. 
Um, if what I'm sharing with you interests you, I highly encourage you to get um, their book, Br Bringing Words to Life, which has now been updated, where they, this is a great example of taking great science and helping us translate it. Very nicely done. But what they argue is that it's, you know, figuring out what words to teach is an impossible task because there's gazillions of words. So it's like, what do I teach? When I was a speech language pathologist working with little kids, I was doing stuff like teaching transportation words, truck, entire, and tractor. It's like, why was I doing that? It's because I had no idea what words to teach. And so they argue that we have to divide words into three tiers. And I know I'm going fast. Um, get their book and I'm happy to send you some articles for more depth. But we can take basically every word and put it into a tier. So tier one words are high frequency words, everyday words that happen over and over and over in conversations and books and play. They're sort of, you know, they're high frequency words. Because of that, most kids are gonna get these for free because they're gonna hear them enough, they're gonna get into um, the neural architecture. Then you have tier three, which are highly, highly, highly specialized. These are words that are low frequency and they happen in one context. So they're super specialized, like vinyasa. You don't know the word vinyasa unless you do yoga. And if you don't use yo do yoga, you don't need to know vinyasa. So these are really specialized. But then you have this whole middle tier of a couple thousand words that are lower frequency. So kids are not hearing them every day. They're lower frequency but they're useful in multiple disciplines. So they're not hyper-specialized. So if you take a word like power or powerful, it's gonna come up in language arts, science, math, music, theater, et cetera. So if you have a kid who doesn't know power or powerful and they're reading across the curriculum, that word is a pressure point. And if the child is missing much of that tier, reading comprehension is gonna be blocked. And the crazy thing about these tier two words is nobody's teaching them. The content area teachers are teaching the highly specialized words for their, you know, for their science unit. Nobody's teaching tier two. I did a study of speech language pathologists, vocabulary therapy with kids with vocabulary problems. I watched countless therapy sessions and they were like three tier two words that were ever taught. And that was for kindergarten, first and second grade kids who desperately needed someone to be teaching them these tier two words. Okay. Okay, I had to skip a little bit. So um, idea of tier two words, um, one of the, th I'm gonna go back one. Now that I've introduced you to this concept, it's pretty easy to say what tier a word is. So sab, tier one, explain, tier two, amino acid, tier three. Okay, so I mean, there's some you could quibble about, but in general, when you see them, you know them. And if you want to teach tier two words explicitly, it's really important that you can provide a good kid friendly definition. So take the word like comment. It's really easy to provide a kid friendly co definition. Comment is to say something. Okay. Um, and so occur, attend, mention, emerge, admit, haunt, these are all good tier two words that you can teach because you can do a good kid-friendly definition. There are some tier two words that you just can't define, then let it go because you'll just botch it up. So if sticking with the idea of robust vocabulary instruction, Beck and McEwen and people who do this work, including me, would argue that the best vocabulary instruction happens in context. And the, all of this work starts with a text. For younger kids, you're using a storybook. For adolescents, you're using passages. But the idea is that you're using authentic texts, like a storybook, and you're using the text as a place to locate these tier two words and to teach them every day. So this is from The Snail and the Whale. Here's some text from that book, A Humpback Whale Immensely Long, who sang to the snail a wonderful song. You've got a um, tier two word right there, immense or immensely. Um, and she gazed at the land, the ski, the sky, the sea, the land. You have the word gaze. 
Uh, the snail felt helpless and terribly small. There's that word helpless. So right there in authentic text, kids are engaged, you're reading it. And that is where robust vocabulary instruction is situated. So the most commonly, uh, commonly studied approach is to integrate ro robust vocabulary instruction into your read alouds. With older kids, usually the kids are reading a text, oftentimes about something controversial, like should women vote? Um, of course they should vote. Um, but this is really, really simple um, to do. And so the typical approach to robust vocabulary instruction is you're gonna have a read aloud. And within the context of the read aloud, you're gonna teach explicitly several tier two words. And you're gonna do this in the context of the read aloud, okay? So it's in context, and then you're gonna be sure to do this rereading again two or three or five more times because words are learned in bits and pieces. So the way this looks, the snail felt helpless and terribly small. You're gonna stop in the read aloud and have an elaborated encounter with that word where you, if, if you look just at the bottom here in most studies, you have an elaborate exposure where the teacher or the SLP or the parent stops and identifies the word. Oh, helpless. That's one of our power words. You define it. Helpless is when you don't know what to do. You can't help yourself. You discuss synonyms. You use it in another sentence. Like I felt helpless the other day when my car broke down. And you have kids say the word to get that phonological representation. So you have this experience embedded in the read aloud in context, probably four or five times within the context of a read aloud. Then you're gonna do that again down the road. Um, so I just put here a sequence. Michael Coyne in Connecticut has done a number of studies of this approach with kindergarten and first grade kids. And this is his little script that his teachers go through um, when they encounter these words. The one thing Michael does in his work is they usually follow a read aloud with some sort of interesting word work to give you know more richness to that encounter, like a graphic organizer. Um, I do want to share that um, before I continue, we did a the Language and Reading Research Consortium for which I was the um, leader of that group. We did a very large uh, multi-state five grade study pre K K one two three where we provided very rich um, language instruction in the classroom to a very large group of kids. And what we found is that by improving academic vocabulary, much of which we did through an approach I just described, what we saw is a mediated impact on kids reading comprehension of, I believe, narrative and expository text. So that's one of the most recent examples in the literature where we were able to show that improving academic vocabulary does provide a pathway to enhanced reading comprehension. And I'm gonna close by expressing my appreciation to you for being here tonight. And I put this up because there's so many great tier two words here. Gratitude, abundance, acknowledge, recognition, appreciation. So thank you very much. And I'm trying to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for that talk <clears throat> on how to construct lexicon. That was very interesting and insightful um, and really appreciative for the resources and authors that you shared. So we'll circle back up with you to get a list of some of those references and some of um, your own work. And we'll get those posted for everyone who's joining us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, next up, we have Dr. Julie Washington. She is a professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Irvine. She's a speech language pathologist whose research focuses on the intersection of literacy, language variation, and poverty. Her focus for this forum will be 
supporting cultural and linguistic differences in the classroom, promoting equity and success for all children. It is my pleasure to introduce my mentor and now dear friend, Dr. Julie Washington. Thank you, Ryan. I will now share my screen and I'm happy to be here tonight with such an esteemed group of people. Laura, that was excellent. I really enjoyed it and I did learn a lot. And as Ryan said, I am going to talk about supporting cultural and linguistic differences in the classroom um, and really promoting equity for children. And I'm gonna talk about things a little differently than people are used to. Um, I have a history in Georgia. I'm happy to see a lot of people that I knew while I was living here who are on this in this meeting. And so let me begin. So our research is weird. The American Psychological Association reports that the majority of social and behavioral research around the world is based on samples that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Ooh. This research, um, this weird research, um, these countries, the societies that these come from account for only 12% of the world's population, but they account for 80% of study participants. So for researchers like myself, um, I work with different populations of students, but we do a lot of convenience sampling. And so we end up with students who are college students as our participants and also professors' children. Why does this matter? Because it reminds us that many of the standards, the expectations and the benchmarks that we've established for brown and black children really don't include them when those benchmarks and standards expectations are established. And then once they are established, we impose them on these groups without including their voices or their cultures or thinking about what the values are of the groups that we study and the groups that we serve. I'm a speech pathologist like Laura, so I'm a clinician. What does it mean though? It means that many of the language guidelines we use are weird. Many of the reading benchmarks that we've established are weird. And it also means that many of the expectations that we impose on parents and families are not culturally informed. They are Western weird. Language is an important way of transmitting culture and cultural beliefs are represented in the way that we use language. They are represented in um, the way that we think about language and communication and interacting with each other. So if you're a child growing up in any culture, you're not just learning grammar and sounds um, the way that we are typically talking about it in research, but you're learning how to use language in order to be a competent member of your speech community. And so when students come to us um, to school, they come from their own speech communities. And when they get to school, they are joining another speech community. And so the success of a child in a community depends upon their ability to learn and use language in the community. But when we meet kids, they're coming from their own communities. And guess what? The speech and language in any given community doesn't necessarily match. So here are some early studies that were um, done by Oaks and Schieflin, where they went into communities that were primarily in on Pacific Islands and characterized the language of the people who were in those communities. These were really important studies um, to think about language being used internationally. So this is what they said about Samoan culture. Infants are not directly addressed until they learn to crawl. Moreover, the second bullet, when infants begin to crawl, they are addressed with orders, instructions, negative sex, sanctions, and caregivers who do not use child-directed speech. Is that an unbiased interpretation? I don't think so. It is an interpretation that's based on our own thinking and our own filters. So we're taking our filter with language and applying it to a culture to which it does not really belong. And when we do that, we develop deficit narratives about um, other cultures, and we pathologize those differences. 
So they go on to say that Samoan children do not receive responses from their addressees and turn-taking does not dominate their conversational experience. And as a speech pathologist, those are the kind of interactions that I'm always looking for. But that is because I ascribe to a weird culture. About the Kaluli people, they said, it's an egalitarian society. Prelinguistic infants are not considered communication partners. There's no joint attention. There's no child-directed speech. Um, and they are not taught to label, which we thought was a universal. Turns out that it's not. It's not a linguistic universal. And they are taught communication, though, that matches their culture. And um, I wanted to lift some of this up tonight when we're thinking about equity, because we need to think about the values and the um, interpretations that we're applying to um, di different cultures in our research and in our teaching. So um, children are not considered communication partners, pre-linguistic infants, children. Wow, I remember growing up that my mother was always admonishing me. You might imagine that I was quite a talker when I was a child. Stay out of grown folks conversation. Because as a child, I was not a communication partner. But what I could do was observe and listen. And in many cultures, that is the way that language is transmitted. It doesn't necessarily match what we think that language should look like or the way that parents should be um, interacting with children from a Western standpoint and from an educated standpoint and from an industrialized standpoint. But it is the standard for a lot of parents and it deserves to be recognized and respected. Families are different. Communication styles can be quite different. I talk a lot about direct versus indirect styles, which we'll talk about a little today. Interaction styles are different. Cultural practices and expectations for children are different. We saw that with the Samoan and Kaluli examples. Now, I talk about direct and indirect language styles as it relates to African-American kids. Those of you who are out there who are working in preschool and kindergarten, this is often the first clash of, clash of culture that we see for African-American children in schools. Most African-American communicators and language users are quite direct. In fact, we value it as a culture. So this first example, first bullet I saw in a school, Jamal, little boy Jamal's running around the room. Jamal, I think it would be a good idea if you sat down. That's very indirect. So Jamal stops for a second and it sounds like a choice. So he treats it like a choice and decides not to sit down. And then the interpretation of him is that he doesn't listen. He's not um, compliant. And the reality is coming from a direct culture, that was a choice. It was not a Jamal sit in your seat. That's a cultural difference. The second one happened to me when I was 18 years old. So Jamal's four, I was 18 and I wrote a paper as a freshman in college. And um, I was a pretty good writer and I wrote this past this um, story that I thought was pretty good. And my professor wrote on it, you should consider changing this sequence and making it more active. Well, I read it, I considered it, and I didn't change it. And so when I saw him the next time, he said, I told you to change this. And I said, no, you didn't. You told me to consider it. And he said, change it. And I said, why didn't you just say that? And so even as an eight-year-old, it was a clash for me because I'm used to people being direct. And sometimes when people are really indirect, I don't really even know what you're talking about. And so that's just a difference in culture. When I was a student, a master's student getting my degree, I remember my professor saying in a language development class that when kids are young and their, their language is um, not very sophisticated, they're very direct. And, she, and then when they get, um, their language gets better and more sophisticated, they can use indirect language. So as an example, she said, a little boy who is young, still using not very sophisticated language says, give me a cookie. And then she said, and then when his language gets more sophisticated, he says, mm, that cookie sure smells good. And I listened to that and I thought, boy, if I had said that to my mother, mm, that cookie sure smells good. She would have said, stop being mealy mouth. If you want a cookie, ask for it. And so that indirectness was not something she valued. And so it wasn't something that I did. And it's something 
that I still don't do. But it doesn't mean that I don't respect my kids. It doesn't mean that I can't be um, indirect. I can be if I need to be. But in my culture, I know it's valued. So in my community, I use it. But when I'm somewhere else where I know it's not used, then I can be indirect. But in my own culture, it's valued. And we need to know what's valued in the cultures of the children that we work with. So I study kids who speak dialects. And so when we're talking about kids who are bi-dialectal, speak two dialects, or multi-dialectal, speak more than two dialects, these speakers are connected to several different communities by each one of their language varieties because language connects us. It's part of our culture, it's part of our identity. Each one also signals a really distinct identity and group membership. The ones that I chose, Southern English plus General American English plus Gullah plus African American English. This was a student that I taught at Georgia State. She was from the South, so she had Southern English. She was an educated student, so she was learning General American English in college. She spoke Gullah. She was from the coast of South Carolina and spoke Gullah fluently and she was African-American, and so she learned African-American English. And each one of those languages signals an identity and part of a group that she belongs to. And the ability to speak these varieties and switch in and out of them when needed is a really valuable gift. Across the world, language varieties have been identified as having an impact on language-based skills like reading. That's what I study. It's important to pay attention to the ways that kids use language if they're going to become proficient readers, writers, and spellers. Language variation is also called dialects. For those of you who are saying, what in the world is she talking about? A variety of a language is spoken by members of a community that are united by some variable like race, ethnicity, or region. So this is within language variation, whereas when we talk about bilingualism, it's across languages. And so these are some examples, just a few examples of American English varieties. Um, Southern English is one, definitely. Chicana English, African American, Spanglish, Appalachian English. There are so many language varieties in the United States that are that um, define groups, but also when you look at the states like North Carolina, North Carolina has seven, six or seven identified dialects and probably more. And so many of us speak these um, varieties and we are really focused on as scientists making sure that when we're talking about equity, that we affirm the dialects that students speak and acknowledge what they are and learn what they are not. They are not bad reproductions of language. They're not bad grammar. They're not slang. They're not incorrect or undesirable. They are rule-governed language systems that are derived from major languages. They're spoken in every country in the world and by specific groups, communities, and in specific regions. Some dialects, uh, dialects are talked about in terms of prestige, and that's one of the things that's important for the way we think about them as listeners. Some dialects are called high prestige, where you attribute positive characteristics to the speakers. One of the highest, um, when I talk to groups about it, that people always mention is British English. When people hear a British accent, they think that the person who's speaking is high class and probably related to Queen Elizabeth. Low prestige varieties are the ones where when people hear them, they attribute, they attribute negative characteristics to the speakers. So they think negative things about you just because of the way you talk. Guess what, Georgia people? We know that Southern English is one of those. Southern English is considered a low prestige variety. People hear a Southern accent and they think all kinds of things about you that aren't um, accurate. It hurts when language is used. It is used in a way that's conflated with your worth, your intelligence, and the importance of the people who speak it. And so when we go into these language communities and we judge the speakers based on the way that they're using language and decide that they're less than, not as smart as, that hurts people. And if you can imagine how much it hurts an adult, imagine how much it, how much it hurts a child. What we know about language as it relates to reading is that reading is a language skill. Um, Laura was talking about that. She was talking about vocabulary. 
Oral language is an important foundational skill that, become, that starts long before kids ever get to school. We also know that a lot of our students who come from ethnic and language minority backgrounds, from low income families, and who speak these language varieties other than general American English are at higher risk for having lower academic achievement and low literacy levels at school entry. The majority of African-American students, eight out of 10 are reading at a basic level or below, and only 19% are considered proficient or advanced. So when Goldie Mohammed and Alfred Tatum and others talk about getting past this idea of basic foundational and getting to proficiency, we really do need to get there, but there are so few students who are reading well in the community. Um, but you know, our goal is to get them to those beyond proficient levels that they talk about. But language variation impacts reading in predictable ways. Um, so teaching reading to children whose language differs from the language of the classroom and from the structure of academic text adds complexity. Um, it adds more of a load. We call it a cognitive load to reading where kids are having to do this extra transformation where you're listening to the oral language, then you're looking at print and seeing something that's very different. And um, so when these students get to school, they are learning the kind of language Laura was talking about, that academic English, but they're also learning the language variety of text in the classroom. So there's an additional kind of language load that these students are experiencing when they get to school. And we talk about this in terms of the mismatch hypothesis, this idea that when your oral language and your and print don't match very well, that it makes it harder to read. And um, this was proposed to Laura's point about we've known about what to do with vocabulary and how to address it for a long time. We started talking about this mismatch issue and how it impacts reading, you see, in 1969 was when it was first discussed in print. That's a long time ago. A lot of people on here weren't even alive. And um, just briefly, this is a paper that uh, Mark is here. Mark and I and our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin did together. And we looked at how much dialect um, impacts reading when you're talking about oral language and um, print that doesn't match. So this is a test of the mismatch hypothesis. And what we learned was when the two systems match, it takes approximately 350 trials to get to 75% mastery. But when you have an oral system and a written system that don't match, it took more than a thousand trials to get to mastery. So it is slowing students down when they come to school and they have these language systems that they're bringing from home that don't match text. And we have also learned that it's not just the mismatch between classroom English and dialect. It's the magnitude of the difference between text and oral language that makes a difference. So the more dialect you speak, the denser your dialect is, the harder it is to learn to read and the longer it, take, it may take for you. And so we talk about dialect density, we quantified it. It's the degree or rate of dialect used by speakers. And if you look at this continuum on the page, the students that we're most concerned about are the ones in the high dialect category, the ones for, for whom more than half their utterances are impacted by dialect because these are the students whose language is furthest away from the language of text. So ling linguistic distance is another way to talk about dialect density. So we know that it impacts spelling, it impacts reading, it impacts writing. There's a lot of literature that has established that to this point. And when we look at our own data, you can see that if you look at the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, that's language variation. The more language variation you use, the lower your scores are on, this is the syntactic processing subtest of the TOLD, the test of language development. So language is impacted. Language comprehension, the more dialect you use, the more work you have to do, because frankly, your language is getting further and further away from general American English. So we know that's true. And the same is true for reading. We see the same pattern across grades. The more language, the more dialect you use, the um, less, less well you score on. This is the passage comprehension subtest of the Woodcock-Johnson. And so we know that this is true for students, that they have work to do when they get to the classroom to get to text. And what does that mean for us in terms of thinking about them? 
there's some important questions. What is, the, what is our role in supporting high dialect users? High dialect users are overwhelmingly black and poor when we talk about African-American English. So what is our role? Is it to change what they're doing or is it to change what we're doing? That's the question I think we have to ask ourselves. When we think about when students come to class, are coming into our classrooms and we know that they are um, linguistically um, different than what they're going to encounter in the classroom and in text, we know that we have a job to do and I think we need to think about it differently. Do they need to learn to assimilate to the language of school or do they simply need to learn how to read? So are we trying to change who you are as a language user or are we trying to teach you to read and to be successful in school? It's an important question. I've been talking about assimilation a lot. I talked about it earlier today in a talk that assimilation is inherently biased and racist. When we talk about students assimilating, the students are doing all the assimilating. What we're talking about today is that teachers need to adapt. When you're talking about equity and inclusion, we need to adapt to the language that's used by children, not just ask them to assimilate toward us. When I was at Georgia State and we were really intentionally trying to diversify the speech and language program there, we were successful. We did some things that really worked. And so we got a really nice diverse mix of students from African-American, Asian, Latino backgrounds into the program. And, you know, I know from my own experience that that's not enough. So when we met with those students to see, to check in with them, how are you doing? Um, is everything going okay? Is there anything we could do differently? Every one of those groups, our African-American students, our Asian students, our Latino students said, it's really hard to be in this program because when I come to school, I have to monitor how I talk, how I move, how I walk, whether I'm doing the right things, whether I'm doing them the right way. That's what assimilation does. They were using so many of their cognitive resources focused on whether they were correct in the way that they were moving and talking and interacting that those resources are being taken away from other things like learning. And so when we ask students to do this kind of assimilation, we're really asking them to do a lot of work that we're not willing to do. And so if we're thinking about really being equitable, really considering the diversity of our students, we have to think about how, what the exchange looks like. This should be bi-directional. It shouldn't be just kids assimilating toward us. We also need to take the time to learn more about them, who they are, and how we can use that knowledge to better serve them. Can we accomplish um, one without the other? Can we teach kids to read without having them assimilate toward the language of school? And the question for us is how do we do it and affirm at the same time, affirm the language culture and value of the child's speech community? Those are the questions I think we have to answer. It is possible to help children learn the classroom language variety without sending negative messages about African-American English. We don't need to correct students. We don't need to talk to them about how their grammar's not good. Um, it's incumbent upon us as instructors and the adults in the environment, frankly, to um, learn more about what our students are bringing to the classroom and the things that they're doing that characterize their culture and understanding how to integrate those into our thinking and into our teaching. So the challenge for us is to balance the need to respect the home language while we're also helping students to gain facility with classroom language so that we can support the development of reading and writing. When children are learning English, we understand that learning a second or third language can slow you down when you're learning to read. The learning curve is steeper and we have to give children time to learn the new language. We have not given this same consideration to children who speak dialects. Within language variation also impacts reading, writing, spelling, and mathematics in predictable ways. And we could support students more by helping them to extend what they know 
to include what we're trying to teach them instead of trying to suppress. So we need to provide more opportunity. You know, we talk about, we used to talk about code switching a lot. And anybody who's heard me talk lately knows that I've been talking more and more about translanguaging, which is an idea that comes from bilingualism about giving students access to their full linguistic repertoires when they're in the classrooms, instead of expecting them to learn and to um, interact in a system that they are actually weak in right now and are still learning that when we think about who they are when they come to school, these kids are language experts in their community language and they need to learn the language of the classroom. But until they do, we need to give them the opportunity to learn, to think, to problem solve in the language that they are strongest in, not the weak one. And I do believe that this tendency to push students toward abandoning their home language as soon as they get to school and not allowing them to use it to help them scaffold this new learning just makes the job harder for them and makes it less likely that especially these high dialect users are going to read and write. So we need to recognize that students may need to use their own language varieties for problem solving and you can model it without correcting them. Don't be so quick to try to eliminate the use of home languages. Don't be so quick to correct examples of language varieties in speaking and writing. It creates a deficit perspective and it makes children's, children reticent to want to read, write, or take linguistic risks. When a student stands up in front of, of a classroom, they mispronounce words and you correct them in front of the class. A lot of times it's part of the dialect. I gave that ex as an example in a paper that we wrote last summer of like in the South, Many of us know the SKR for STR, street for street. And there's an example that we uh, that is often used, and I used it, where a young man got up to read in front of the class. And when he got to STR, he said SKR. So he said strawberry instead of strawberry. The teacher stopped him in the middle of the reading and said, say it this way. And so the first time he's like, oh, okay. So he said it, but then when he read it again in connected text, it was strawberry again. And she kept correcting him until he no longer wanted to read. He was ashamed to read. She was embarrassing him, him in front of his friends and making him feel like his language was less than. That's not, not really appropriate. And it made him reticent to do it again. When she called on him to read again, he didn't want to do it. So this is a child who was proud of his reading. And then because of the way that his teacher um, reacted to it, he no longer wanted to do it. We don't want to be guilty of doing that to students. So I'm talking about weird science, weird research. And so I'm encouraging us not to be weirdos. We are Western, we are educated, we are industrialized, we are rich. I'm not really rich, but I'm doing okay. We are democratic, but we don't have to be oppressive. We don't have to decide that we are going to be the final word and that we know what's best for children and their families without asking them, without taking into consideration who they are, where they come from and what they value. I included the word oligarch because they used it in the, on TV all the time now. It's like the big word. And there's just no way to use it in good conversation. So I just thought I'd add it to the end of weird O. And so let's not be that person. Avoid pathologizing differences. Um, when children come to school and they're doing things that are different, they're not necessarily things that are um, disordered or impaired or things that we have to fix. Become familiar with the cultural practices of the children you intend to serve and you're less likely to pathologize those differences. And most importantly for our students, especially our young students is respect and affirm the cultural language and practices that they bring to school and integrate them rather than suppress them. And that is it for me. We will be taking questions at the end. Thank you for listening. Woo! Dr. Washington, thank you. Thank you for that timely talk.
Hello, this is Mark Seidenberg. I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. This is a re-recording of a talk I initially gave at in Atlanta at the Atlanta Speech School. It's being re-recorded because the original was lost, corrupted because of a tech failure. Uh, I'm also taking advantage of this opportunity to try to improve the talk if I can. So the title of the talk is Efficacy, Efficiency, and Equity, the Goals of Early Reading Instruction. I'm a scientist, a university professor, and an author. I've studied reading, language, and learning for many years. I'm concerned about low literacy levels in this country, as everyone seeing this is as well, I'm sure, uh, especially among children who are at risk because of factors that can affect learning. Those would include developmental conditions like dyslexia and a range of other ones, and also environmental conditions, things like low income, uh, living in an underserved community, uh, lack of resources or insufficient resources in the home or in schools or in communities. There's another environmental condition that affects children's progress in reading, and that's how they're taught. They need to know about reading, they need to know about language, and need to know about knowledge of the world, things we use language to talk about. Our researchers know a great deal about these topics. Um, these are people in the cognitive sciences and cognitive neuroscience, covers a broad range of disciplines. Uh, very little of this research is incorporated in teacher education. Here I mean not just teachers in the classroom, but principals, superintendents, everybody, secretaries of education. Uh, there isn't much of it in the development of curricula, instructional materials and practices and assessments as yet either. There is some. So uh, the idea is that we could maybe improve literacy outcomes by incorporating more of this good science. I did write about, about this. It was a review of the basic science and a discussion of its educational implications. Uh, I also tried to uh, provide some history about why there's a disconnection between science and education. And I had some ideas about what might be done. I was not the first researcher to address these issues by any means. Uh, Keith Stanovich uh, and Marilyn Adams of uh, are, were prominent uh, among the researchers who um, discussed reading research and its relation to educational practices in the 90s. And in fact, um, their, their efforts contributed to the reading wars of that period. Um, in, in my view, the main impact of uh, that discussion uh, was uh, that whole language was rebranded as balanced literacy, and it, it didn't result in significant changes uh, in, in the classroom. The idea of using the science of reading to improve literacy has finally caught on. Uh, it was amplified a great deal by Emily Hanford's wonderful audio documentaries. Uh, it was also um, brought to um, broader awareness by Dana Goldstein uh, uh, in her book, The Teacher Wars. Um, the science of reading has been taken up by state and national advocacy groups for dyslexics, such as Decoding Dyslexia, among others. And it's been taken up by new organizations such as the Reading League. So a lot has happened over the last several years. Legislation in many states related to reading, uh, focusing on teacher certification, uh, in some cases mandating that curricula and practices be based on the science of reading, uh, a lot of investment in professional development for in-service teachers to bring them up to speed, uh, and certainly more is coming. Uh, the authors and publishers of major curricula are scrambling to include the science of reading or find ways of not including it, uh, justification for not including it. Um, and states have invested heavily in professional development for teachers. Uh, the demand for information about the science of reading is sky high. Uh, science of reading based curricula began to appear. Uh, Kilpatrick and Hagerty are, are, are two of the names here. Uh, companies, large and small, are marketing courses, workshops, webinars, and so on. 
many teachers are eagerly adopting the science of reading approach and identify as advocates, believers, uh, and are also sharing materials via teacherspayteachers.com and other websites. The Facebook group, The Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College, has 140,000 members. And there's a hashtag science of reading corner of TikTok, which are short videos explaining some of the science and demonstrating what are supposed to be science-based methods. One of the creators there has over a million likes and 100,000 followers. This is astonishing. People are getting more information about the science of reading from sources like that than from any scientist. So this is all good, right? And uh, I would say yes and no. So the yes part is the greatest greater awareness of fallacies underlying whole language, balanced literacy approach. It's going to be hard to go back to that. Not impossible, but it's going to be harder. Uh, there's greater awareness that there's a large body of relevant research to draw on. Uh, the interest in connecting research and practice has certainly grown enormously. Uh, and of course, there has been legislation in response to the lack of movement from the educational establishment. Side question, are legislative remedies effective? Can you mandate what and how teachers teach? Uh, is the legislation based on an accurate rendering of research findings? I don't know, but this has certainly gotten the attention of curriculum authors and publishers. And so uh, there is certainly going to be a response. My question is, you know, what is the science of reading that's having all these effects? And here, I think the situation is not so positive. And really, I view this talk and other uh, activities that I'm engaged in is uh, trying to really improve the situation. So, you know, the science of reading, I mean, researchers just talk about, you know, the fact that they do research on reading and related topics like language and child development. There's a massive body of research gathered over many decades all over the world. Uh, it's international. It involves numerous disciplines, methods, researchers, laboratories, languages, writing systems, cultures, and peoples. But this is a big body of research. Uh, the science of reading, which I put in quotes there, attempts to use this research to improve education, which is a good thing to do. But we need to call this the science of reading movement in order to distinguish it from the actual body of research. One is the science, what people have found. The other is the attempts to apply the science to improve educational outcomes. So uh, these are really quite different um, endeavors. So, you know, reading research, the kind of actual science is it's basic research conducted by researchers with relevant training and experience. Uh, it requires a high level of scientific literacy, meaning, you know, not only just being able to conduct the research, but understanding uh, how to uh, evaluate research and how to weigh evidence uh, in order to draw conclusions about what's known and what isn't. Findings are published in peer reviewed research journals subject to peer review. Um, doing research in this area demands familiarity with the previous literature and, you know, which has to be your knowledge has to be continually updated because the science is advancing. Um, you, you, you cannot do research in this field without knowing what came before. The audience for this research is mainly other researchers, some popularization. Uh, and there is a lot of research relevant to the classroom, misspelled on the slide, uh, but it's usually left to others to implement. I should say, you know, there, there are people who are more focused on instructional issues and um, and there are people who are more focused on uh, learning and reading in, uh, in, in a more general sense. Uh, in, in neither case are, are, is, are people really getting to what I call the last mile, which is kind of, you know, well, what are we going to do in the classroom this year, this week with these kids? That's a much harder challenge. Um, the researchers aren't involved with teacher education, um, mainly advisory involvement in developing a lot of the popular products, 
the major curricula, for example. And certainly, uh, the researchers are not teaching in uh, you know, K-5 classrooms. The science of reading movement, you've got people, organizations that interpret science for teachers and other practitioners. Uh, these are middlemen or intermediaries between research on one side and practice on the other. Uh, there's a relatively small number of thought leaders, a term I hadn't encountered until I got into this um, kind of um, translational um, enterprise. Most of the folks involved here are uh, educators and uh, policy ad advocates who uh, don't have much background in uh, the relevant research. Uh, relatively low levels of scientific literacy and familiar familiarity with the research literature. This varies, of course, and there are exceptions. Uh, information is distributed in a very different way than the basic research. It's via books and websites and webinars and social media. This content isn't peer reviewed. It's market reviewed. It's really based on sales, hits, followers, market share, profitability, how much people like the material. The audience is mainly people with who also have little scientific background, but have a high interest in learning about. It. For example, many classroom teachers. Well, what happens when demand for information about reading research is high and knowledge of the field, background knowledge is low? You get a science of reading movement that doesn't have a lot of science. It can't go very deep into the science. It has to focus on simple findings that can be understood by people who don't have much background. And it is being chosen by people who are not themselves necessarily researchers or experts in the relevant science. I think this is a fair characterization as of what has been happening over the last few years. My view is I'm speaking up because I don't think this is adequate. We have a problem that we need to solve. We need to solve the problem of increasing shared knowledge about reading research, about what's known and isn't known, where to look for the answers. So with that in mind, I'm going to look at some recent developments. And I'm going to or organize this discussion around three issues that I think are important for all of us to be looking, considering. One is efficacy. Is an instructional method, curriculum, program effective in teaching children to read? A second is efficiency. How much time does it take for how much benefit? Does the program work within the limited time available for reading instruction? The third angle is equity. Does the method work with children from varied backgrounds? where that could include their language or their language variety, meaning dialect, uh, their socioeconomic status, uh, what kind of resources are available in the home or school or community. Methods that have equity will work with children who come from these varied backgrounds. Here's what I'm going to conclude. In terms of efficacy, we don't really have a lot of evidence about the efficacy of any methods, uh, certainly not the newer ones, uh, uh, which are curricula that are um, based on the science of reading. Like a lot of other approaches, uh, they have been implemented without sufficient, or in some cases, any uh, field testing or, or evaluation. It's, it is very hard to get this kind of evidence. And it leads to the problem of introducing programs before we know that they're going to work. Uh, this is also worrisome because some of the newer approaches incorporate quite novel assumptions about learning to read that aren't consistent with existing research, in my view. Efficiency, how much time does it take for how much benefit? You know, the efficiency of instructional practices tends to get ignored, it gets ignored in research, and it gets ignored in building, you know, comprehensive curricula that have more activities in them than could possibly um, be done in a, in a school year. Uh, 
there's a concern I'm going to try to explain a little further about over instruction, which is, you know, teaching more than is required to move the child ahead towards the real goals, which are reading uh, with good understanding and so on. There's also, you know, a need to consider opportunity costs. Could the time that went into very detailed and exhaustive instruction about one thing be spent on um, needed instruction in many other areas that contribute to literacy? These are the dimensions I want to consider, along with equity. Does the model work with children from various backgrounds? And, and what I'm going to say here is, with rare exceptions, no. So, you know, educational materials and practices um, are, are developed with, you know, some idealized notion of the children in, uh, who are the uh, end users. Uh, and, and they do not work equally well for children from all backgrounds. Uh, and I, they do not adequately consider how instruction functions for children from different backgrounds. Um, many of them, most I would say, rely on availability of resources outside the home, which aren't equally available, and so may inadvertently magnify the effects of inequities, and so contribute to increases in gaps rather than decreasing them. Now that's a lot of opinion, but it is, these issues are discussed in uh, an article by Julie Washington and myself, an American educator, and they were the main topic in uh, chapter 10 of my book. I want to make clear right here that we should not be confused. What, whatever the limitations of what we're doing, it, it still remains the case that beginning readers need instruction in order to gain foundational skills, which will then allow them to move ahead to more advanced literacy activities. They need instruction related to things that are the kind of conventional aspects of the written code. The fact that we use certain letters, that the letters have names and sounds associated with them, that the letters combine in certain ways to spell words. There's instruction about how the writing system represents spoken words, about the correspondences between print and sound, standardly called phonics. Um, I've got spelling sound correspondences on the slide twice, so it must be, must be really important. Uh, more generally, we're concerned about mappings between spelling, sound, and meaning, as in this uh, illustration that I uh, have here. So there's no, this remains true, and I, I don't want anything, anything I say to create any confusion about this. The questions that I'm raising are about what to teach in these areas, how, how to teach, how much, when, for which children, so that we can achieve greater efficacy, efficiency, and equity. Here are some concerns to think about. I think they can be addressed. I think we need to recognize limitations or discuss possible limitations in order to move ahead. I have provided additional discussion of uh, some of these issues in a series of blog posts on the SeidenbergReading.net website. First concern, science of reading movement is limited to a few classic studies that are relatively easy to understand. And it also relies on relatively few authorities, uh, those being individuals and organizations. This is pretty much the antithesis of how science is done. It's kind of science-y, I would say. And the problem is, I, I don't think this level of understanding is an adequate foundation for creating effective curricula and practices or for telling whether a particular approach is good, bad, or indifferent. So I've said the science of rock, of science of reading is like classic rock, you know, classic rock. 
uh, I was there for it. I mean, these are some great songs, mostly, and uh, a lot of people really love them. Uh, they're d definitely worth hearing if you had heard, haven't heard them already. And if this is your taste, you can listen to them all you want. Your heart's content. You are free to ignore everything that happened after. You can listen to uh, uh, this stuff uh, all the time. Uh, there is classic rock kind of in in the science of reading, you know. So the classic rock studies are the simple view of reading, the five pillars of instruction for the National Reading Panel, the area stages in orthographic learning, the four-part processor, which is actually uh, based on some work that I was and I did, uh, the reading rope, which was uh, Hoss Garbaros brilliant uh, illustration of how different kinds of knowledge come together to support reading. Uh, the baseball study, some of you may know. There's a few others. So these are pretty very well-known works, and they are great uh, studies for the most part. Uh, and, and they're certainly worth knowing if you don't know them already. They are a fine place to start. I don't want to take anyone's away anyone's pleasure from discovering this research. The, the issue is you can't stop here. And, and we, we can't ignore everything that came later. In fact, a lot of this research is quite dated. And, and uh, we might have actually learned something since then. The bigger problem, though, isn't that just that the research is dated. It's that it didn't actually address what I would say are the most important contemporary issues. They are things about what we teach. When do we teach it? How much do we teach it? How do we modify what we're teaching depending on care, the background of the child? They, we're not focused on things about efficacy or efficiency or equity. These are on the table now. Uh, the consequence is that if you're focused on this limited set of studies, you're going to have to introduce other assumptions in order to turn it into practices, curricula, and so on. And you kind of add additional assumptions to go from those studies into an action, something you can actually do in a classroom. The problem is those additional assumptions that you need to do the translation may not be supported by other research. But people won't know that. This is the paradox. Because you'd, you'd have to know about more of the research in order to recognize the limitations of the translation being done. In other words, if you're just focused on the classic rock studies, then you won't know whether a translation is supported by other research or not. Here's a good example, a simple view of reading. I know everyone loves the simple view of reading. I enjoyed the simple view of reading. I was at a conference at which and Tun were pre presented it some years ago. And there's a feeling of pleasure when you discover their main, main major point. So there's a crucial insight there about the conditions that govern learning to read. Roughly, beginning reader already knows spoken language at the level of a five or six year old. Their initial task is learning about print, which is this new code, and how print relates to the spoken words that they know. A beginning reader doesn't relearn spoken language. They learn how to access that knowledge in a new way. This is a compelling argument for instruction about properties of the written code and the necessity for instruction about properties of the written code and about the relation between print and sound. That is a compelling argument and is one that everyone should know. Now, Granting that, what are we going to teach, when, how much, and for which children? Now, the original Simple View papers by Phil Goff and his colleagues didn't say. It wasn't their focus. They were trying to make a different point, and it really said, the original paper said very little about instruction. So, you know, here's the standard uh, Simple View of Reading um, figure. And, um, you know, as a researcher, as a scientist, the way I approach this kind of figure is to say, okay, well, what's in the circles? So decoding, what is it? 
What types of knowledge are involved? How are they acquired? Do you really mean decoding or do you mean word recognition? What are we talking about here? Uh, what are the procedures and types of knowledge that are involved? What are the behaviors we're trying to account for? What are the best methods for actually uh, helping children acquire uh, the relevant knowledge and procedures and so on? Also, what other factors are involved? For example, you know, decoding, recognizing words, how are they influenced by things like accent, dialogue, dialect, and you know, the amount and variety of children's spoken language experience. All those things do have an impact on children's ability to decode words, learn to decode. Same questions arise for the language comprehension part. What's in there? What's the target? How's that stuff learned? Notice that children's spoken language continues to develop after the start of school. So there's development happening there as well and things to think about uh, in, in terms of instruction. And then how do these things influence each other over time? These two components are con continually interacting. They're influencing one another. People talk about reciprocal learning between print and, and, and spoken language, and that, that is, that is a, a, a important. So the figure itself really leaves many things open to interpretation. And in the subsequent 40 years of research, nearly, uh, people have explored various interpretations of the figure. So, you know, Lots of studies are said to support the simple view of reading, but when you look into it, they're actually not studying exactly the same thing. So these are all different versions of the simple view that people have proposed in recent years, and there are many others. Yes, there can be seen as consistent with the original observation, but no, they don't all say the same thing and they don't all have the same implications for instruction. What's the moral of the story? Simple view is important to understand. It stated a really important insight about the conditions governing children's beginning reading. It's not the place to look for our solutions to the questions about how to get children to develop the reading skills that we are trying to help them gain. So we can say that simple view includes a crucial insight about to learning about learning to read. At the same time, we recognize that we have to look beyond it to figure out essential questions about instruction. Well, it, I don't think there's complete agreement on this. So the Reading League, which is a nonprofit organization that offers various services, recently issued a policy statement about the science of reading, trying to define it that I read as favoring a fo focus on classic rock studies. Those are the ones that they actually um, discussed in detail. And, um, you know, the, the implication is, look, um, we need to, you know, the, the, the rationale is that we need to have some building blocks that teachers and other educators can understand. Here's some good ones. And uh, let's go from here. And there's less emphasis on, you know, well, we actually need to know what's happened in the subsequent decades of research. So uh, I think this is really giving up way too much uh, and that um, uh, it, we, we can't settle for just, you know, a focus on these, uh, uh, these classic studies. We need to increase shared knowledge, not narrow focus to a few classic studies. Of course, these studies serve a useful function, but they led to further research that deepened our understanding and that is highly relevant to contemporary concerns about efficacy, efficiency, and equity. Okay, here's the second issue. Proposal. Professional development is not a substitute for professional training. So current effort, to inform teachers about the science of reading focus on professional development. That is because we all know why. This material is not routinely included as part of free service teacher education. And in my, in my book, uh, uh, and, uh, I trace the history of this. It's been going on for a long time. 
this failure to include re relevant sorts of research as part of teacher training. So we are relying on professional development activities because it's the best option at the moment. And it is an important element in moving ahead. Well, you know, people need to learn about the cognitive science relevant to reading. And, you know, one way to do it is as preparation for the job be a college level coursework. That's not really happening much, but it certainly seems preferable to trying to learn on the job via professional development courses among, you know, for people who have other responsibilities, for example. And, you know, there's a lot of material to learn. Uh, on, on, uh, it's kind of better right to do it right in the first place. Still, professional development is necessary. It's a routine part of teachers, uh, educators experience, professional experience. I, I think we have to ask, where are the schools of education and what can be done to move ahead with pre-service education in relevant research? In Atlanta, uh, at this point, I raised concerns about letters. So letters was the kind of first, you know, science of reading kind of professional development program and it's still the main one. And many thousands of people have benefited from it. Uh, other programs have since appeared and, you know, there's a marketplace for this kind of um, professional development. My concern about letters focuses on uh, one thing, which is, a, uh, its role in promoting the view that children need to gain knowledge of phonemes as components of spoken words and phonemic awareness as the prerequisite for learning to read. This view has been taken up by others, Kilpatrick and Hagerty, certainly, and, and others. I don't mean to just call them out. Uh, I have discussed this concern in more detail in a blog post uh, that I, I, I would point you to. Uh, the concern does not negate the value of letters, but letters is not above constructive criticism. And here I think there is a concern. So, you know, in, in you know, unit two, K3, it says, you know, although learning phonics requires phonemic awareness, the term phonics pertains to learning to read printed alphabetic symbols. Phonemic awareness activities, on the other hand, do not involve print. They are listening and speaking activities. They can be done in the dark or with a blindfold on. However, it is recommended the students watch the mouth of the speaker while they are listening to. Again, I discuss this in greater detail in a blog post. I also have three talks about phonemes, phonemic awareness, and reading instruction that really address the issues about where knowledge of phonemes comes from and its implications for instruction. Now, letters is a program and says other things about phonemic awareness. It may be that the message is not entirely consistent, but teaching phonemic awareness in the dark, that was really not a good suggestion. It's like teaching children to play a piano blindfolded. If you're given the reciprocal relations between print and sound, starting from when the child is very young, there isn't any rationale that I know of from the research literature suggesting that children should learn about phonemes as units of spoken words without being coupled to print. So if you're committed to this kind of phonemic phonemes first, do it in the dark, be able to just do it using spoken language activities, it, it'd be helpful to provide some theoretical or empirical rationale for that, because I don't see it. A third concern is that there's an adaptation, adoption of uh, curricula and practices that are only loosely linked to the science of reading. Uh, David Kilpatrick, I think, is an example of this. So he has an early uh, instruction curriculum and support materials. It doesn't mention a broad range of research studies. Uh, it re mainly relies on the classic studies, some of them that I mentioned, plus um, the Aries orthographic mapping idea. 
it is, in my view, a very garbled account of how reading works. Uh, it also includes strong recommendations about instruction that are novel, that seem to have been introduced for this curriculum, uh, and certainly untested and, and uh, uh, I believe, questionable based on other considerations. Kilpatrick's materials merit a more detailed review that I could provide here. I'm just going to make a main point, which is the program has three major elements, early phonemic awareness instruction, advanced phonemic awareness instruction, and then the treatment of orthographic mapping and, and learning sight words. All of these are being called into question, not just by myself. Uh, and, and they are questionable in light of other research that isn't considered. Um, so this suggests um, a need for caution in using these materials. And it certainly uh, merits further discussion, which I'm sure is going to occur. So look, the primary goal, uh, a primary goal of reading early reading instruction is the integration of print and speech behaviorally and in brain. It is a signature of skilled reading. I discussed this in several talks. One is an MIT talk that's on YouTube. I mentioned this study by Don Shankweiler and colleagues about integration of speech and print uh, as observed using neuroimaging, where the uh, integration is greater for people who are better readers. What it means is that the speech and print areas are the overlap. They are the same to a greater extent for people who are better readers. The same thing is found uh, cross-linguistically in skilled readers of different languages. This is a paper by Jay Rickle and all in PNAS, where integration of print and sound is a characteristic of skilled reading, even despite differences in writing systems, like, for example, English versus Hebrew versus Chinese. So we're trying to do, in instruction, I think we're trying to promote this development of the integration of print and sound. And our activities can either facilitate this or interfere with it. Um, uh, what I'm suggesting is um, some of the ideas about phonemes uh, being un units of speech and developed via speech spoken language activities might be less effective than ones that um, integrate, um, haven't, haven't focused this goal of integrating print and sound. Okay, the, so that's, that's about learning phonemes at the outset and whether phonemic awareness is a prerequisite for reading or something that develops along with print. Uh, the second element that um, Kilpatrick emphasizes what he called advanced phonemic awareness. This was a unique, uh, a novel re recommendation. Um, he has recently acknowledged that there's the evidence supporting this is lacking. Uh, and there is a long paper by Clemens et al. that is a critique that focuses mainly on this. And now there are, are responses and there is um, back and forth communication about this. Uh, Shanahan has covered this issue uh, in detail on his blog, you know, RIP to advanced phonemic awareness. I have to say, the, he's correct. The evidence for it and justification for advanced phonemic awareness is poor. Uh, somewhere I read, I don't know if it was Shanahan or someplace else, about advanced phonemic awareness. That ship has sailed. You know, my question is, what happens to the educators who are on board? So people are, are stoked about incorporating the science of reading in their practices. Now they're getting materials that are pitched as showing you how to do that. Then it turns out that the narrative about what the research shows about how children learn to read might not be entirely reliable. And indeed the evidence for certain practices might be lacking. Well, what are the people, that's like pulling the rug out from people who had made this commitment. And I, I just don't think we can afford to do that. 
there's a history of people getting on board with various science-based approaches and then finding out they weren't actually adequate. There's behaviorist period, believe it or not, whole language had that character. It was based on the cognitive science of the 1970s. So there, there is this history of, hey, there's great science here. You need to incorporate it in your practice. And then having the rug pulled out when it turned out either there was something limited about the research science, as in the behaviors case, or the translation of the science into practice ignored other things that were also extremely important, as in the whole language case. I just don't feel like we can continue this pattern without losing people. Anyway. Uh, the third thing is orthographic mapping and learning sight words. Um, Orthographic mapping is a term introduced by Airy. Patrick uses this theory as his justification for uh, recommendations about learning sight words and phonic decoding. Look, you can't rely on a single study or theory, no matter how distinguished the researcher. And I am sure that Linnea Airy would agree with that. Researchers will ask, What's known about how people learn to read words with various properties? What is a sight word? How would people learn words that have certain properties? We look at all of the relevant evidence. We weigh it, evaluating how informative it is, it is how, how, how well the studies were done, and so on. And having weighed the evidence, we come up with conclusions that you know, reflect our best understanding of how things work. In fact, there's a lot of research on sight words, irregular words, sounding out novel words to draw on. And it's not in uh, uh, David's materials because he really is um, pretty much just implementing a version of Aries theory. This is something you can't ignore other stuff that's out there, especially if it's highly relevant and might really lead to effective practices. There's a further problem because um, there's concern that um, Kilpatrick has misinterpreted Aries theory. And so what she was saying is not actually showing up in a straightforward way in what he is saying. This is a post that she made about it. Why does this matter? Um, well, the Kilpatrick curriculum is popular. It's said to be based on the science of reading. It emphasizes phonemic awareness, which is one of the five areas mentioned in the National Reading Panel report. And it definitely seems pretty sciencey. However, it includes novel recommendations about teaching phonemes, phonemic awareness, sight words. These aren't, they're untested, but they're very questionable based on other research that is outside the scope of this work. So at this point, I, I drew an, an analogy here or, or, or made, made an additional point, which, which is in all seriousness, uh, there is something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is what well established. It's when uh, a person uh, often in a, in a position of authority will overestimate their knowledge. It's the situation in which a person doesn't know what they don't know. And I think there is some of that happening here. Well, what if you are a teacher, you're, you're not a scholar in the science of reading, you are dependent on other people to um, provide you with reliable information about what's known. So what happens to the people who have adopted this program, the people who rely on, on, on it? Um, well, whatever limitations are built into the program are passed along to you. So, you know, Kilpatrick may not know what he doesn't know. And the people who are using his materials don't know that he doesn't know what, what he doesn't know. So I thought this was a Dunning-Kruger effect, kind of second generation by proxy. I, I mean, this is a serious concern. So I think we're seeing a repetition of what happened with whole language which was you know, uh, an approach that was adopted um, in advance of evidence that it worked. Um, 
and and you know as with whole language having spoken with many teachers for whom this was um the way of thinking that they were that they learned um and have used uh, it is very hard to revise deeply held beliefs we, we have learned this haven't we from things that are going on in the world and i'm concerned that uh, you know, if there's premature commitment to some of these materials that have, have various flaws, we're going to have another generation of people who are going to be kind of told you got to unlearn what you just learned and do something else. So I'm concerned about that. Um, I think we should be clear that the problem isn't with the research. There is quite a lot of research. The research is solid and, and the science of reading has really basically not gotten to the good stuff yet. But there are problems with these init this initial implementation of a science of reading based curriculum. Um, here's some other things to think about in trying to connect science with educational practice. One thing is whether there's an overemphasis on explicit instruction. So um, there is a lot of instruction going on. Uh, and uh, I think I know why. Uh, I'm writing about it in uh, another post. Um, but it, it, it's kind of because, um, you know, there was this idea that um, learning to read, learning a first language is natural. It's something that we're all sort of, you know, biologically prepared to do. And all you need to do is have the right kind of environment and children can learn to talk, not through instruction, but by using language. Um, then people pointed out Goff again with a memorable phrase, you know, Goff said, reading is an unnatural act. You, know, you have to, unlike learning a first spoken language, you got to be taught to read. And that's true. There are lots of arbitrary properties of the code that you have to be taught about. I think that there's been a further step, which is people concluded that, you know, learning a spoken language is natural and learning to read is requires instruction. And if you don't teach kids things like phonics rules, phonemes, phonemic awareness, task performance, sight words, et cetera, then kids won't be able to learn any of this. And so we're seeing it is a pendulum shift towards a very heavy emphasis on explicit instruction. I think we need to question that. Reading is supposed to be getting the understanding, recognition of the words and the sequences of words is supposed to be automatic, like a reflex, where we want to focus on the content, not the process. Why are we teaching children rules or making explicit certain kinds of patterns? that exist in language and in print, we're doing it so they catch on to what there is to learn. Most of what they actually learn happens implicitly without conscious awareness. It does not mean you just sit them in a room and let them have unlimited free reading. I've discussed this elsewhere. What it does mean is that we need to find some balance between explicit instruction which helps the child get off the ground and figure out that there is a system here and that there are things to learn. And creating the conditions that promote implicit learning. It's sometimes called statistical learning. It's been studied extensively. It starts in infancy. We're doing it all the time. You're doing it right now. We're always updating our knowledge of language based on experience. Okay, so um, there's some further discussion of this in the blog posts, but you know we're trying to find a balance between explicit instruction, which is necessary, but also can be overdone, and implicit learning, which requires creating circumstances that will allow kids to benefit. I'm concerned that in what I'm seeing that there's a loss of focus on the goal. The goal is reading. Instruction is there to advance this goal. And I see a lot of um, attention to instruction that's about the components of reading. Certainly the five pillars has that character. Um, 
a lot of attention to performing uh, tasks that aren't really reading at all, like, you know, phoneme deletion or something like that. Look, instruction in these areas is justifiable to the extent it advances the actual goal, which is child increasing their ability to read in certain measurable ways. So there's no special word for knowing that there are 44 phonemes or 38 or whatever you think there are uh, in English or memorizing 100 spelling rules. One has to ask, how did people learn to read before they knew what the 44 phonemes are? I can't tell you what the 44 phonemes are. I don't believe there are 44 phonemes. I think it depends on your theory. Anyway, um, the point is that we're doing these things in the service of a goal. It's not that no spelling rules are necessary. It's that we're doing it to the extent it is advancing the goals of reading and comprehending and spelling. So the point here would be that instruction needs to be conditionalized on the child's progress. There's no absolute level of phonemic awareness or knowledge of phonics rules or something like that that needs to be achieved. Uh, there's the efficiency issue, which I've mentioned. Instruction takes time. And one of the things about rules is that they take time to, to teach. Um, Explicit instruction is slow, uh, and and rules like rules for you know um, spelling rules, for example, um, they are they're kind of like rote learning. I mean, it's a thing you have to memorize. There is a benefit; you can generalize to new cases, but there's also a cost, which is you have to learn the rule. Again, there's some more material about this and stuff I posted. You don't really need rules to do generalization. You can do generalization off of these statistical patterns that I mentioned. The point here is, you know, both researchers and practitioners, I think, focus on, look at the research literature and say, was there an intervention or an activity that worked? Did it produce some kind of benefit? And of course, everybody knows, we also have to ask, what were the costs and benefits? How much instruction was required to get? How much of a boost? Is the amount of time it took to obtain an effect in a research study realistic in the real world, given all the other things that have to also be going on? And then there are these opportunity costs. What could we be doing instead? The equity issue, Julie certainly discussed this in her talk. Uh, if you look at the way uh, instructional materials are set up, I'm thinking of the large commercial uh, curricula. Uh, they assume a certain kind of student. They don't really take into account very much the variability that actually exists among kids. Again, there are some exceptions. Um, those materials will work quite well for certain kids. They may be ones who come to school every day, who can understand the teacher quite well, who have adequate nutrition and non chaotic home life, who have access to resources in the home and school, et cetera. They may be work better for people whose language is close, closer to the language that's in the books they're supposed to be learning to read. So these assumptions are obviously not uh, valid, equally valid for all learners. And you know we're beginning to see organizations, groups showing up that are concerned that the quote unquote science of reading is really too narrowly focused on certain kinds of kids. I, I do share that particular concern. If you look at phonics lessons and ask how they land with a kid who has a different accent, it's, 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 it's a cause for concern. Uh, Julie and I um, discussed this in our American Educator article, and uh, I, Julie mentioned some of these things in her own talk. So let me try to summarize. Using research on reading and related topics to improve literacy outcomes is still a great idea. And there have been successes. There is greater knowledge of many of the uh, issues and uh, some of the research. We want to ma maintain momentum, but you know, it has to be effective. Eventually, there's going to be an accounting. We're going to need to show that these things actually yield benefits. 
right now, in my view, success is not guaranteed because of the shallowness of the science, which is arising from real world considerations. But I think we kind of need to address them. I think it's resulting in the premature adoption of practices that are kind of inspired by research, but not closely tied to it. And that some of these questionable practices um, are only exist because people haven't digested a lot of the other research that bears on, on these questions. Uh, relying on thought leaders is not a good plan in science or in the science of reading. This is going to open the door for people who are hostile to using reading research to improve practices. That's also coming. So we need to do our part as well as possible. Because if I, I feel like I should be pointing out these limitations rather than leaving it to someone who's really kind of hostile to the whole enterprise to do it. Okay, some people responded to the first version of this talk as too negative. Uh, uh, that talk was a disaster for me. The circumstances were so horrible, I couldn't tell what people could see or whether they could hear me. It, it, I didn't know who was in the room. It, it, I couldn't interact. And then the, the question period got cut off, which is really crucial when you raise, you know, issues like this. Um, so people thought the talk was really negative and that I hadn't said enough about what people should do. Look, I'm raising some questions about some popular studies and programs and ideas. This is not popular. And it, it is certainly easier to point out limitations of current materials and practices than that's the easy part. I have to think this is a step towards improvements. And what I'm doing here is trying to give people things to think about, to look more closely at, to ask questions about, and to seek information about. The message here is not stop what you're doing. It's all wrong. Of course, it's not all wrong. And moreover, I can't tell you what to do that's better. I can try to identify some of the issues and we can together figure out ways to do things better. Now, I am working on something that I think will provide more directly useful information in the near future. It is work in progress that I'm doing with Margaret Gold. Uh, and there is some discussion of this on the recent blog posts on my website. So I hope to have a more useful set of um, PowerPoints for you in the near future. I mean, I hope to have more useful information. In the meantime, you know, I think we're all doing the best we can given our various backgrounds and situations. Thank you to all the teachers, reading specialists, and other dedicated individuals who are highly effective and have helped so many children become readers and continue to do so. This talk is about finding ways to make that the standard for all literacy professional, professionals and the standard outcome for children. Thank you for listening.